offices in Florida and Puerto Rico, and I'm also very involved with uh, physician training education on, on the clinical use of peptides. Here in the States, we've been using peptides for quite a few years. Um, and, you know, for longevity purposes, age management, anti-aging purposes, I wanted to highlight just a few of the peptide categories that are more commonly used for these purposes. And um, most of our peptides, we are able to source from compounding pharmacies. And so, and it, it's been a bit of a challenge with the regulatory uh, landscape changing, constantly evolving. FDA has revised their definition of how many amino acids constitutes a peptide. So that's been challenging, but anyhow, um, so a few of the popular peptides. So we have in the growth hormone secretagogue category, um, we have a few of them like sermorelin, ipamorelin, CJC1295, desmorelin. So these peptides are mainly to increase the growth hormone secretion in, in patients. Uh, and we know that when we increase uh, growth hormone production, we can achieve uh, faster tissue repair, response, regeneration, improved body composition, increased muscle mass, increased fat mass, and uh, skin repair. So it, it's usually these categories are very popular with uh, patients. As they grow older, their idea of one levels go down. And by boosting endogenous growth hormone production, you get some clinical benefits there. Now, this is not directly for a hormone. We're actually just stimulating, maximizing endogenous production. So in addition to the growth hormone secretagogues, we also use a thymosins. Um, specifically thymosin alpha-1, thymosin beta-4, and thymine. Um, the thymosins uh, have different roles in our body. Um, TA-1 or thymosin alpha-1 is mainly for immune stimulation, immune repair. It can help fight off uh, senescence, immunosenescence. It's been clinically studied for, for many, many years, many uh, articles published on the use of TA-1. Um, thymosin beta-4, is more of a repair uh, peptide that can help repair tissues, um, has been studied in the field of dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, neurology. So we use it more for acute situations. Um, and then the thymulin, which has been sort of an in-between benefit there. It's been shown to both have anti-inflammatory benefits and also repair capacity and immunomodulating benefits. Following on the peptide categories that we really use, um, when we look at longevity, we're talking about epithalon, pineal on their pineal derived peptides. And um, we also have uh, peptides more focused on repair and anti inflammatory capacity, such as DPC 157 and uh, KPB. Uh, there's also some mitochondrial peptides, mitochondrial targeted peptides, such as MOXIE. SS31. Some of these peptides have already gone through uh, clinical processes, such as SS31. So we, for, for some of these peptides, we have a lot of clinical data. Um, there's also cosmetic peptides, such, such as GHK copper, which actually has a role beyond cosmetics. It's also a uh, gene modulator and anti-inflammatory repair peptide too. Um, plus, there's many more. I mean, I just obviously we don't have the time to highlight all the different peptides we're using clinically, but um, just wanted to give an overall overview of the different categories in which we're using peptides clinically with our patients. Um, I know that in other parts of the world, uh, it might be harder to get some of these peptides or, or easier, really depends on where you're at. I, I do a lot of international lecturing and consulting and some countries are a lot easier to get peptides other than that but uh, we try to do that so what are you know peptide benefits how can they help right um one of the things that is very positive about these peptides is that the results usually are fast fast enough to get clinical response uh, relatively quickly um and peptides can help with many things energy metabolism memory cognitive um, faster repair, recovery, uh, antimicrobial benefits, improved immunity, anti-cancer effects, and obviously enhanced longevity, right? So this is part of what we're looking at and why we're using these peptides. 
Um, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting because even before pet sites took off clinically uh, in the United States, um, there, they were, a lot of them were already being used by bodybuilders and people in the healthcare and in the wellness sector, fitness sector. So they do have a long tra trajectory, these peptides. And, uh, you know, thankfully, we're just advancing the clinical aspects. How, how can these peptides impact biological age, right? Or, or what mechanisms could potentially be involved, right? So um, one of them is enhancing immune function. And uh, the other is decreasing inflammation. And if you put those two together, you get you know, the whole concept of targeting or addressing inflammation, right? Um, we're also seeing increased repair process and, uh, and even telomerase activation. So um, some notable peptides with uh, potential longevity application. And again, this is just a very short list. I think there's many more peptides that can have these benefits, right? But I highlighted epithalon, GHK copper, thymosin alpha-1, and the glaucoma secretagogue class, right? Um, epithalon, it's a pineal-derived peptide for amino acid chain. It was studied or ha it was studied for many years, many decades in the old Soviet Union and the Russia. And it's been shown to have an excellent safety profile. There's a, I know in Russia, there were many studies on on the peptide. So, and it's interesting because among the studies, uh, it's been shown to increase telomerase activity, um, stimulate DNA repair and have cells uh, able to divide more than what would be the maximum limit. It's also shown benefits in chromatin expression and uh, clinically it's increased uh, longevity in a patient's youth. And again, very, very, very safe peptide. Um, uh, GHK peptide. So this is a tripeptide, um, glycyl histidylglycine. It's been extensively studied for cosmetic purposes. Um, and it's usually associated with cosmetic benefits, a lot of creams with GHK copper, uh, a lot of formulations, topical formulations. But really interestingly, the original research looked at repair systemic repair, body repair, organ repair with GHK and copper. I actually had the benefit um, of interacting with uh, Dr. Picard, who was the one who originally discovered this peptide and published a lot on it. And, um, you know, and again, he, he was very adamant that the repair aspect, the systemic repair was uh, more relevant or more important than the actual cosmetic benefits, which it does have. It's great for the skin, so one and your skin, you could definitely use copper and GHK copper. Um, what's really interesting is it's been studied in the in the can in the con I'm sorry about that in the context of uh, gene expression and uh, specifically even cancer expression, and it's been shown to modulate uh, a lot of different genes and uh, favoring more of an anti-inflammatory profile, and it's been shown to even silence some of the cancer expressing RNAs. So we actually use it systemically in certain cancer patients and overall sustainable repair processes. And then thymosin alpha-1, um, like I mentioned, extensively studied peptide, 28 amino acid sequence. It's an endogenous human peptide. It's responsible for a healthy immune system. Um, and it's been shown to reconstitute the immune system in thymectomized animal models. So one of the things that I look at with thymosin alpha-1 is helping ward off inflammation, right? And this whole trend as we grow older towards senescence and the dysfunctional immune system. Um, I've, I've looked at doing, using TA1, I've looked at uh, CD4, CD8 ratios, and I've noticed improvements in the ratio. Uh, reverting inverted ratios with the A1. And of course, we use it for, for cancer, which is, you know, well, it's not good. And then, you know, the growth hormone secretion, about, right? So I mentioned these, they will stimulate growth hormone secretion. And uh, there's many benefits to having optimal growth hormone secretion in the aging body. Um, 
And there's also some interesting studies where growth hormone has shown, for example, an impact on thymus gland with the patient to the immune system. So there's there's a lot of things here that are coming into play when we're yes. Now, I have a few examples very briefly that I want to discuss, very interesting cases. Um, this was a first one was a 56 year old female patient of mine. She had been on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for the past seven years. She's been using uh, estradiol plus testosterone. Um, and she's been doing two rounds of epitalin, right? 50 milligrams per cycle twice a year for the past five years. So she's been very active. That has been really her mainstream of uh, treatment, the, the hormone replacement therapy and the epitalin, right? Um, so she's 57. She she had a glycan age of 20. Um, and all of her blood chemistries are optimal. Look wondrously well. No systemic inflammation is almost zero. It's very, very controlled. She looks great, actually. She does TV. And she she looks really good. Um, and we correlated her telomere length to that of a uh, average uh, 27 year old patient. So um, definitely, there's been an impact there on what she's doing. And you know, we know also that estradiol therapy has a positive impact on biological age. It's been documented. So I think the combination of both doing the epitalin and having the hormone replacement therapy has been a great benefit for her. Um, this second case, 62 year old male patient, who's been also on home replacement therapy for the past eight years. He did growth hormone therapy for four years. That was seven years ago. After that, um, we just switched him over to the growth hormone secretor route. So he was doing uh, CJC with hypomolin for the past three years. And, you know, usually we will cycle these treatments. Um, he was also doing the GHK coffee. Uh, works out, biological age of 47 uh, for this patient. And um, and again, same thing, main, main, mainstay of treatment is the hormone replacement and these peptides that he's doing. Um, he's been doing really well. And you know, what I like about the secretagogues versus actual growth hormone replacement is that with the secretagogue therapy, you don't have that risk of uh, overdosing. It's all physiological, it's glandular production. So we're not, you know, with growth hormone, if you go too aggressively on the dose, you can have some side effects and all that. So here we're just working with the patient and the capacity to produce. And this other example with a 53 year old male patient. So he was diagnosed at age 48 with a B cell lymphoma. He's in full remission. He, under, he underwent both like a traditional chemotherapy. Um, and also, we also did, you know, the complementary therapies, you know, like peptides with time missing off. What? Um, he, after after the initial standard treatment, he has continued to do time missing off for one on a weekly basis, right? And uh, his biological age is 41. Full remission, he has a great CD4 CD8 ratio. And uh, he's otherwise doing extremely well. And you know, it's interesting because usually with the cancer therapy, like the chemotherapies and such, you can observe uh, worse outcomes, you can observe uh, somatic cell damage. I've had some patients on who have done chemotherapy that have different markers of biological age, that they are older, right? So with this patient, he has continued doing the Venice and Alpha 1. His chemistries are perfect, and uh, he has a good biological age. And uh, finally, this other example, a bit different, right? Um, so this example was a 56-year-old male patient. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's obese, obesity grade 1. You know, he's been taking metformin for 500 milligrams at night for the past three years. He's not a diabetic, he's not diabetic. He, this was recommended both as a preventive measure by his primary care practitioner, as well as, you know, because of the longevity potential benefits of that form, right? Usually runs with an elevated CRP, about two to four. Um, he, you know, he's not a very compliant person. Uh, he, he has not really focused on losing weight. He has never been on peptide therapy or any other biological intervention. 
the only thing we were doing was the performance, right? And we also know that the performance will work differently if you are uh, going to be diabetic or, or not, right? So um, his biological age is 77. It's extremely advanced age. Um, I have a, I have a, he has an appointment with me in a few weeks and I hope he can take this more seriously, make some more significant uh, lifestyle interventions, including some peptide therapy to help improve uh, his parameters, right? So, I mean, and you can see here different cases, different applications of peptides. Um, what, you know, overall, I think we start, we, we have a lot more to, to learn, right? But what are we seeing, Jeff? And this is a, a trend in my practice. I'm seeing that usually patients on the different peptide therapies are more consistently shown the lower biological age. Um, and obviously, in addition to the biological age, they're getting a good quality of life and a lot of different markers that are improving. And, you know, like I said, peptide therapies can act relatively fast. And uh, so that's something that patients do like. They, they see that impact really fast. Um, what is still, I think, missing or still pending, you know, obviously, we still need more research into how particular peptide combinations can impact biology. Um, and there's many other peptides that I mentioned the categories that uh, it's still I still want to look at and see how they can impact biological. For example, some of the mitochondrial targeting peptides, the MOX2, um, and others repair peptides such as these. So I'm very interested in just going and looking more and more how these peptides um, can help and help impact uh, and improve biological right, in addition to other parameters. So more to come as we get more data on this, have more patients tested and follow through, and uh, getting more <clears throat> more practitioners in our network that are starting to implement the biological age test. So I think that we're going to be able to see a lot more on that end uh, in the next few months, few years. And you know, of course, if any of you want more information, you can also visit our our site, the Copeptide Society. We're always very active with that sort of. Uh, Learning and interacting with other clinicians, sharing data.